Good afternoon. My name is Vas Bednar, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG. I'll be moderating today's conversation on the Competition Act and Canada's digital future. This session is being recorded and will be made available online later today. So if you're with us watching live, you can share it or reference it later. And if you're watching the recording, well, you already know. Here's how the sessions will work. After Commissioner Boswell's opening remarks, we're going to pull in our panelists and get right to chatting. And again, if you're joining with us live, you're going to be able to share questions with us in the chat and all work to integrate them into our conversation. We won't have a separate Q&A, so remember, ask away. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce Commissioner Matthew Boswell. He's a man of many analogies. They've ranged from Britney Spears, the free Boswell hashtag, to a cowboy in the Financial Post, and the Globe and Mail recently wrote that he has a burr in his saddle. But in reality, he's a little more of a sheriff in that the Competition Bureau enforces the Competition Act. And this sheriff has predicted a, quote, holy battle over features of the Competition Act, like the efficiency defense. In the fall of 2021, he delivered a powerful speech at the Canadian Bar Association's annual conference entitled Canada needs more competition. And the Competition Bureau has a comprehensive response to the Senator Weston led consultation that you can review on their website. Commissioner Boswell, welcome. We're happy that you're here and over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thanks for that uh, kind and interesting introduction, Vass. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And I want to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek people. The area surrounding Chaudière Falls here in the Ottawa Gatineau area, not far from where I am, is considered a sacred gathering place to the uh, Anishinaabek people throughout Turtle Island. It's known as Asidnabka, the place of glare rock to all, all Algonquins. And the Center for International Governance Innovation is also a gathering place, a gathering place of ideas and of people, all meeting at the intersection of technology and international governance. Gatherings like this today, this series um, that CG is putting on is how change happens. And it is why this is the right place for me as Canada's commissioner of competition to do three things today to talk about the importance of competition in Canada, to share ideas about where things are going, and to talk about the importance of public engagement in how we define and enable competition in this country. So let's talk about the incredible importance of competition in Canada now and for future generations. Uh, commençons par une question. Pourquoi la concurrence est-elle est importante en fait? Elle est importante parce qu'une économie forte est une économie compétitive. La concurrence stimule la productivité. Elle aide à contrôler les prix, un point sur lequel je reviendrai dans, dans un instant. Et elle profite aux citoyens, pas seulement certains d'entre eux, tous. So let's begin by asking, why does competition matter, really? It matters because a strong economy is a competitive one. Competition boosts productivity. It helps keep prices in check, a point I'll return to later. And it benefits citizens, not just some of them, all of them. What are those benefits? They include lower prices, more choice and higher quality for consumers, stronger businesses that are incentivized to perform and innovate. It gives small, medium-sized companies a fair chance to compete and win. There are plenty of challenges now in the world. A long global pandemic, war in Ukraine, and inflation, the likes of which we've not experienced in two generations. All of these have real consequences for our, our economy and are layered on top of existing issues that we were grappling with in the digital economy. Thus, an important conversation has started anew about competition and its role in our economic health. Much of the conversation is about Canada's competition laws and the need to modernize them for the digital marketplace. Of course, in the public debate, 
Some just want to maintain the status quo. Others say and are saying quite loudly, it's well past time for changes. I think uh, many of you will know where I stand uh, based on my record as commissioner. And it's quite simple. We must adapt. Our future as a country, our economic future as a country demands it. That takes me to my next major point today. Where are things going in the realm of competition policy? As I've said, an important conversation is taking shape about the role of competition in the Canadian economy. It's occurring against a backdrop of increasing concerns about the rise of corporate titans and the changing nature of our digital marketplace. Luckily, new thinkers have engaged in the debate and parliamentarians have noticed this. First, last October, Senator Howard Weston launched a consultation examining the Federal Competition Act in this digital era. We at the Bureau were part of that discussion, as were uh, several folks on today's panel. Next, Minister Champagne announced uh, that he would be taking a careful look at how to improve the Competition Act. Then, the federal budget was tabled in April. It proposed amendments to the Competition Act as a first step in modernizing the way we promote and pro protect competition in Canada. In my view, this is meaningful progress in a short period of time. As mentioned, significant amendments are proposed as a first step and they are before Parliament right now. They would enhance the Bureau's investigative powers, criminalize wage fixing and no poach agreements between employers, increase maximum fines and administrative monetary penalties, they would also clarify that incomplete price disclosure is a false or misleading representation. Les modifications élargiraient également la définition de comportement anticoncurrentiel, permettraient un accès privé, privé au tribunal de la concurrence pour remédier à un abus de position dominante et améliorerait l'efficacité des exigences en matière d'avis de, de fusion. They would also, these amendments would also expand the definition of anti-competitive conduct, allow private access to the competition tribunal to remedy an abuse of dominance, and improve the effectiveness of the merger notification requirements. The Bureau is fully committed to communicating and applying these changes should they become law. The next point I want to make about where things are going, everyone in Canada has a stake in ensuring healthy competition. With Minister Champagne spearheading the follow-on consultations on the modernization of our laws, we will be having a much overdue debate on what competitive marketplaces should look like. This can't be a debate where we argue in circles. Fixing the problems is something that matters a lot to Canadians and, of course, to me. So let's now circle back and revisit the point about the high inflation that we're all dealing with now. A visit to the gas station or a grocery store these days can be anxiety-inducing for many, many Canadians. Speculating on the causes of inflation isn't why I'm here today. But competition has to be part of the solution. Open competitive markets are critical to keeping prices in check. Know this, less competition makes matters worse. More competition makes things better. And not just on the price side of things. Vigorous enforcement of competition laws is absolutely necessary. It deters business conduct that could otherwise make inflation worse due to collusion with rivals or harm to the competitive process. Vigilance matters as well. Yes, much of the Bureau's current enforcement work is confidential, but I can assure you we have zero tolerance for any attempts to use the current economic context as cover to engage in anti-competitive conduct. Nous travaillons également en étroite collaboration avec nos partenaires, avec les États-Unis, le Royaume-Uni, l'Australie et la Nouvelle-Zélande, nous faisons partie d'un groupe de travail international 
qui se concentre sur l'échange d'informations afin de repérer et de prévenir les cas potentiels de collusion à l'échelle mondiale, y compris les comportements anticoncurrentiels liés aux chaînes d'approvisionnement. We are also working closely with our international partners in terms of vigilance, along with the Competition Enforcement Authorities of the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. We are part of an international working group focused on sharing intelligence and information to identify and prevent potential collusion on a global scale, including anti-competitive conduct related to supply chain issues. So, as I said, healthy competition can indeed make things better. While it's not the silver bullet to combat inflation, more competition must be part of the solution to help address the rising cost of living. As the Bureau noted in our letter to the Bank of Canada in 2020, competition lowers inflationary pressures. It helps Canadians access a wider range of products at lower prices. That's why leading thinkers call for pro-competitive policies to reduce trade barriers, to foster greater competition in digital markets, and to modernize our competition laws. But beyond this, there's a role for governments at all levels to examine policies and regulations to ensure they encourage and not undermine competition in our economy. Open markets, where newcomers can grow and challenge incumbents are at the heart of competition. It's what incentivizes value creation. It rewards innovation. Government rules and regulations can often affect how open our markets truly are. Competition drives productivity. Canada's falling behind on economic productivity and it's high time we do something about that. The recent federal budget is very clear on this point. As I see it, the review of Canada's competition framework goes hand in hand with the drive for productivity and economic growth. This is another reason why a competition law review is so important and why all policymakers should consider how regulations can leave room for competition to thrive in their jurisdictions. Competitive intensity is vital to driving this innovation that we desire, this increase in productivity that we desire. It is how firms gain a competitive edge on their, on their rivals, driving up productivity growth and boosting our standard of living in this country. If we do this right, we can keep growing, keep competing and keep succeeding as the country, well, well above our weight class. Or we can get it wrong. We can stifle competition whether due to anti-competitive behavior or regulatory impediments, and suffer now and for years in the future as a result. Don't just take my word for it. In 2008, the last major review of Canada's competition policy, the Competition Policy Review Panel's final report said, greater competition is the key to increasing productivity and prosperity. It drives the productivity that ultimately sustains our incomes, jobs, and quality of life. We must do this, not just because it's a good idea, but also out of necessity for a better future. I'm also reminded of what Tom Jenkins, chairman of OpenText and one of Canada's leading thinkers on innovation said. Mr. Jenkins said that despite knowing the critical impact of competition, much of our discussions on innovation in Canada still focus on policy and program activity and not on how to increase competition. Competitive intensity, Mr. Jenkins says, is the elephant in the room. So how do we get past the learned habit of talking endlessly about innovation and productivity as those solutions are elusive and instead focus on producing outcomes? Here's how we do it. We build a competition culture in Canada together. La culture, c'est un peu comme le cadre d'un tableau. Elle nous montre où regarder. Elle délimite ce qui est important. Si nous voulons réellement que les marchés canadiens aient du succès dans l'économie numérique, nous devons mettre en place une culture qui accueille la concurrence à bras ouverts. 
Culture is like a frame on a painting. It shows us where to look. It puts borders around what matters. If we truly want Canadian markets to thrive in the digital economy, we must develop a culture that embraces competition. That's our focus at the Bureau. It's right there in our strategic vision, blazing a path that we started in 2020. And our vision states that we aspire, we're working to be a world leading competition agency, one that is at the forefront of the digital economy and that champions a culture of competition for Canada. So here's how we're executing on that vision. Our new annual plan for 22-23 defines our priorities and gives context to what we're doing in the present tense. On the enforcement side, we're in the process of creating a new digital enforcement and intelligence branch. It will be our center of expertise on continually evolving business practices and technologies and how they impact competition. It will make us better, smarter, and faster by using advanced analytics, intelligence techniques, and behavioral economics to find harm in the marketplace and work with our enforcement branches internally to stop that harm. We're also being vigilant about the lingering challenges created by the pandemic. That, of course, as I've already talked about, includes anti-competitive conduct related to supply chain issues. Our plan also focus, includes focusing on sectors of the economy that are vital to Canada's long-term economic well-being, like digital services, telecommunications, and health. In the telecommunications market, we're seeking to block Rogers' proposed $26 billion acquisition of Shaw to protect Canadians from higher prices, poorer service quality, and fewer choices. Eliminating Shaw would remove a strong independent competitor in Canada's wireless market, one that has driven down prices, made data more accessible, and offered innovative services to its customers. We're taking action to block this merger to preserve competition and choice so that Canadians can have access to affordable and high quality wireless services. We're also advocating advocating for new pro-competitive policies, particularly in markets where Canadians want to see changes now, including health. Soon we'll be publishing, we'll begin publishing the results of our digital healthcare market study. Our reports will make important recommendations on bringing greater innovation, choice and access to digital healthcare across this country. I'm excited for them to be published and I'm excited for you to read them. We're also broadening our thinking on the interplay between competition policy, the environment, and efforts to address climate change. Thinking, of course, means listening first. So on September 20th in Ottawa, we're hosting the Competition and Green Growth Summit so we can better understand these complex issues. And we will do so by drawing on insights of experts, including domestic and international enforcement partners. Then we can decide how it must inform the Bureau's enforcement and advocacy work where there, these two things intersect competition and green growth. Listening and learning are lifelong jobs. And that takes me to the third and final major point I want to convey to you today. Let's talk about the importance of broad and diverse public engagement in the way we must define and further enable competition in Canada. Dans le futur, la mobilisation sera un élément très important de la culture de concurrence dont j'ai parlé aujourd'hui. Outre les modifications de la loi sur la concurrence prévues dans le budget, il y aura une série très importante de consultations publiques sur la politique de la concurrence. Nous devons nous assurer d'entendre un large éventail d'idées et de perspectives. In the times ahead, engagement will be a very important part of the culture of competition that I've spoken about here today. Beyond amendments to the Competition Act in the budget, there's going to be a very important round of public consultations on competition policy. We need to make sure we hear a broad set of ideas and perspectives. 
This is going to task everyone to apply big picture thinking about the level of competition we want to see in our economy. It's, in, it's of vital in, importance to the interests of consumers, workers, and businesses of all sizes. It is that big of a deal. Like I said earlier, we all have a job to do, to stand on guard for the opportunities that are right there for us to unlock, which we can, can if we use fully the levers of competition and innovation and then reap the ensuing benefits. But that is up to each of us as citizens, as consumers, as workers, and as business owners to choose. We must want this for ourselves. And the way we choose this is by getting engaged in this public consultation process. To wrap up, my job here today and every day since 2019 is to persuade you all to consider the importance of competition to a healthy economy, the one we have now and in the future. Competition doesn't just happen. We must choose it for ourselves. Hopefully, I've persuaded you today of how important it is to our day-to-day -day life. It empowers us. It gives us better choices. It also safeguards us against the risks of an unchecked marketplace. Competition is indeed the engine of innovation. And not just for ourselves, for the generations to come in this country as well. Compte tenu des défis qui nous attendent, C'est la concurrence qui permettra de faire avancer les choses d'une manière équitable, partagée et prospère pour tous. Given the challenges on the road ahead, competition is what is going to keep things moving forward in a way that's fair, shared, and prosperous for all. Let's remember that for far too long in Canada, competition was a niche issue for lawyers and economists. We are changing that. Think of competition policy as a kind of market. It has its incumbents defending the status quo. It has new entrants trying to disrupt things. And the biggest barrier to entry to participating in this market, which is to say this debate that's going on and that's gonna get bigger, is the language we use. Competition is truly everyone's business every day. So, at the Bureau, we believe that we all must speak in plain, accessible language about it, open up the debates and discussions to those who bring fresh ideas, perspectives, and expertise, listen to diverse lived experiences. This enriches the conversation. Likewise, accessible language helps businesses understand whether their conduct is lawful. Accessible language also empowers people to make complaints about alleged anti-competitive behavior when they understand the, tech, the technical details we talk about. J'invite tout le monde à participer à cet important processus au cours des prochains mois, bâtissant un Canada plus concurrentiel. I invite everyone to participate in these important discussions over the coming months. Let's work together, build a more competitive, competitive Canada for the many benefits that that will provide now and for future generations. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for the time this morning. Thank you, Commissioner Boswell. It can be challenging in a, in a virtual context because we can't kind of shoot a confetti cannon or you can't hear the applause of our audience members, but we really appreciated your remarks, right? We must adapt. Everyone has a stake building that culture of competition. Let me bring up our panelists. While the full bios for our panelists are in your chat, uh, for those of us who are live uh, with us, I'd like to welcome Brandon Shifley. He's an associate professor in business, economics, and public policy at the Ivy Business School and the director of the Ivy Energy Policy and Management Center. Hi, Brandon. Tahira Dawood is a staff lawyer at the Public Interest Advocacy Center, which you might hear us refer to by its acronym, PIAC. Hey, Tahira. And Robin Shabon is the senior economist and co-founder of Vivic Research. Hey, Robin. Now, Commissioner, I'm going to give you a bit of a water break because my first question is a little bit of a rapid fire for our panelists. And a reminder for our audience that's joining us live, please add questions to the Q&A. It enriches our conversation and it makes my job even easier. All right, team. What 
I'm going to do a, a bit of a go around and I'm going to start with Brandon, and then I'll have to Robin and Tahira. I'm super curious. What stood out from you from these remarks? Was there anything you were hoping to hear more about? Uh, let's get your quick reactions. Brandon, over to you. Well, thanks, Vass. Um, to start, as a Western professor, I'm not sure how I feel about the Sheriff's Queen's University plaque behind him, but really I want to make three points. Uh, one is on unintended consequences. The second is on digital business practices and ambiguous harms. And then the third is on a couple of points that weren't addressed in the, the remarks. The first comment I want to make relates to the Bureau's role as an advocate versus what we want in the law. And I think we need to think hard about advocating for competition versus rewriting the law. And I, there's a quote that uh, Senator Wetson put into his review, and I want to read it out. Putting disparate objectives into a single law would lead to policy incoherence and ineffectiveness. I think we need to be really careful about unintended consequences if we ask a single, ask too much of a single act, that we may chill investment when we actually want to promote competition. The second point on digital business practices, I think this leads into why we're looking at the Competition Act as a vehicle to examine the digital marketplace. Historically, if we go back to first principles, we use regulation to address markets where there are structural impediments that we can clearly articulate the harms. While there may be structural features of the digital marketplace that would warrant regulation, there are also a lot of other harms that are ambiguous, that we've had difficulty articulating or that we want to control. The Competition Act is actually really well placed to deal with ambiguity. We've got you know, a cadre of competition lawyers, we've got the competition tribunal. And so there's a lot of merit in trying to modernize the Competition Act to address some of these harms that arise from market behavior. And it's this nature, this ambiguous nature of the digital marketplace, I think adds credibility to the Competition Act being the vehicle to deal with the digital marketplace. The last point I wanna make is with respect to two terms that didn't show up in the commissioner's remarks. Efficiencies and quantification. Section 96 in the Turbita decision, you know, featured prominently in the Bureau's response to Senator Wetson's uh, uh, analysis. And I think we need to be really careful about how we deal with changing section 96 and the efficiencies criteria. Uh, it's one thing to remove efficiencies as a defense and make it a factor, but the Supreme Court decision in the Tervita case had this really, really good quote. It's the commissioner's burden to quantify all quantifiable anti-competitive effects. You know, this nature that we should be able to quantify the harms. As soon as we start to abandon quantification, it's not a large leap to become untethered from reality. And so I think when we think hard about how we want to modernize the act, especially with respect to merger control, we need to spend a lot of time thinking about this efficiencies provision and the Supreme Court's decision in Turbita. Thank you. Unintended consequences, ambiguous harms, digital business practices, super important things for us to be keeping in mind for this discussion and for more going forward. Um, thank you, Brandon. Uh, Robin, I'd like to hear from you next. Over to you. Great. Uh, well, joining you from my sunny, warm sun room here. <laughs> um, and I have to say the commissioner's remarks also had me feeling uh, warm and positive. Um, I think that they're a signal of a, a new attitude towards competition in Canada. Um, that's more uh, open and constructive. Um, a comment that stuck with me uh, in the comments or in the remarks was this need to be fostering a culture of competition in Canada, this phrase, a culture of competition. The idea that we need to promote this culture of competition in Canada, it's not new. And I know uh, 
the commissioner, uh, past commissioner, John Peckman used to use the same phrase. And what I wanna say is that we need to get really clear on how we're defining competition and culture when we use this phrase, especially as we enter the phase of reviewing the Competition Act like we are today. Um, all of us can claim that we want to foster a culture of competition, but in reality, we might actually be talking about completely different things. Uh, one example that comes to mind for me is the testimony provided by Rogers and Shaw when they attended parliamentary hearings to talk about the Roger Shaw merger. Uh, the parties claimed that the merger would be pro-competitive because it promoted dynamic competition. And I recall parliamentarians being perplexed by this claim, and uh, rightly so. I, I also think that there's uh, relevance to this from a labor perspective, which I'm sure we'll talk, touch on more in this conversation. Uh, in conversations I've had with people in uh, the labor movement through training sessions I've delivered to uh, labor union researchers in particular, when I talk about competition policy, I'm often met with a lot of skepticism. Uh, I hear from people in the labor movement that there's a rhetoric of competition and that competition has been used as a weapon against workers and worker protections. Um, people point actually to the Competition Bureau's research on Uber, which they see as um, condoning practices that skirt really important worker protections. And this research is used as an example of competition, but for them, it's an example of rhetoric of competition being weaponized against workers. And it also reduces the ability for us to work together and engage in broader public discussion and engagement. I mean, why would unions spend valuable resources participating in competition policy conversations when fundamental worker rights are viewed by some in the space as a hindrance to competition? So. I think now that competition policy makers are starting to wake up to the important role that unions have in maintaining healthy competition in labor markets, the Bureau and the government have a lot of work to do to actually rebuild trust with these communities. And a lot of it has to do with how we're defining competition and the culture of competition. So if we want to build trust and engagement, we need to move beyond rhetoric of competition and the culture of competition and get really clear about how we're defining this. And that's why I'm heartened by the commissioner's calls to be defining competition through broader public engagement and consultation. Robin, thank you. It sounds like a future, yeah. uh, the future consultation should maybe have a bit of a glossary, hearing lots about being clear with our terms, which I think is very useful. Tahira, thank you for your patience. Uh, we're going over to you next in terms of anything that stood out for you or something you'd like to hear more or speak more about. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. I would just like to quickly um, say, you know, thank you to the Center for International Governance and Innovation for inviting PIAC to this really important discussion. And uh, yes, coming right to the question and the commissioner's remarks, um, there were quite a few things that struck out for me and uh, they're more like specific to what the commissioner spoke today. So uh, the first thing that stood, stood out for me was the mention of higher productivity and keeping the prices low. And of course, reference to consumer protection. So the thing is, we need to question whether consumer protection is adequately represented in competition law and policy or not. And if not, what do we need to do in order to fix that? So that's one thing that stood out for me. And I'm really, you know, encouraged by saying that the competition commissioner mentioning about comp like prices and comp consumer protection at the very start. Um, the next thing was about inflation. Um, I know that inflation is a huge issue. And of course, like, um, I think the inflation has been going up in April around the consumer price index went around 6.8% and the salaries are not going up. So people are actually taking a pay cut and it's a huge issue. And the role of competition in addressing or at least mitigating the effect of inflation is a really important discussion. And we need to know more about what competition bureau's plan in the short term and in the long term in order to fix that. Um, the next thing I would like to talk about was the commissioner, like the commissioner's mentioning of the new digital enforcement and intelligence branch. That's also very encouraging to hear, but of course I'm assuming that this is a very new branch, so much might not have been done, but we would like to have more transparency as to what that branch is working on and would it be engaging with stakeholders and consumer groups in order to bring forward their perspectives, like the commissioner was mentioning about public engagement. 
So I believe that it's important that those perspectives are also brought into picture, even though it's related to enforcement and a lot of work, a lot of that work might be confidential, but it is important to include that. And the last bit I would like to mention about, I think Commissioner mentioned about the digital healthcare market study. Um, it mentioned, you know, like I heard words like innovation, choice and access. I wanted to know more about the privacy aspect to it. So that was the main issue is the objectives of competition law and place for consumer protection, inflation and the new initiatives by the commissioner. Thank you. Tahira, thank you. And reminder to our live audience, please add your questions to the Q&A. Um, before we move on, I, I wanna take a moment, Commissioner Boswell, I wonder if um, it's possible for you to elaborate a little bit for the benefit of our audience, not anything top secret that the digital enforcement unit's doing, but rather how, how the Bureau works to quantify harms. Cause I think that's actually a, a kind of key aspect of, of competition uh, enforcement in Canada that not everyone might appreciate if that's okay. Well, I think maybe it needs to be that those two need to be separated a bit. I mean, um, as sure. uh, Professor Shifley was saying, you know, we have an obligation when we bring cases to quantify the economic harm that we see coming from either anti-competitive conduct or a proposed merger in the new branch. And and to hear us right, it's we're it's it's we're in the process of building it. We're in the process of building it with uh, additional funds the gate the government gave us um eight months ago um and it's the branch will have different uh, pieces to it including uh, an intelligence piece which is um to a certain extent some some intelligence groups that were in spread about uh the bureau before the branch was created but doing proactive intelligence to discover um activity in the economy that could be offside one of the many different areas of the work we do. And for people who don't realize, mm -hmm. we have a broad mandate to police the country from coast to coast to coast, from mergers to abuse of dominance to uh, multiple uh, false or misleading consumer protection sections to the mother of all evil cartels. Uh, which is companies agreeing to fix prices or rig bids. So we're using, um, and I obviously can't get into it, but new intelligence techniques. We're bringing uh, ex internal experts and, and external experts in to better detect problematic uh, conduct in the economy. We're hiring for the first time data scientists and data engineers to um, better work with the mountains of data that we have at the Bureau and that we gather through uh, investigations. Um, we're also bringing in a behavioral economist, which is a very important feature of our consumer protection work, if you wanna call it that, our false and misleading representation um, work because there's there are a lot of things going on now um, in the digital economy where techniques are being used to in, to mislead mm -hmm. uh, consumers into buying things or into subscribing to things and so we want to bring in the expertise to better understand that um, and the final piece of this branch uh, i can talk about is we're going to create uh, a remedies unit which is going to as we build it up over time, and these things don't happen overnight, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, um, we're going to have a, a much more robust uh, ability to look at remedies that we've agreed to in the past, um, to monitor them, to see how they've worked, so that uh, going forward, if they didn't work or if there are aspects of them that didn't work, we tweak that uh, in our sort of approach to how we fix problems. And that's that just common sense uh, where I come from, but we haven't had the resources in the past because we've been we've been stuck at the the same level of budget for mm -hmm. a long time until we got the recent increase. In fact, we um, until recently we had fewer employees now than we did 20 years ago. So we're getting we're building this back. We're we're building Bureau 2.0 to better serve Canadians, to more vigorously enforce awesome. the law, to detect stuff earlier. Thank you, Commissioner. Team, we've got 20 minutes left and I want to surface as much as I can from all of you in our audience. So uh, Brandon, I think you have a quick follow-up on quantification and then I'll get to some of my more targeted questions. Brandon, to you. 
So this is a follow up on both the quantification point and Tahira's point. And I think one of the challenges that we need to confront when we're thinking about Bureau 2.0 or modernizing the act is articulating the harms in the digital marketplace. And so Tahira raised a privacy concern. And it's not obvious what role the Bureau plays in enforcing a privacy harm. And I think about some recent jurisprudence in Canada where several class actions have failed to become certified because there's no evidence of economic harm or actual loss to class members. And it's on these types of points, I think we need to think hard about precisely articulating the harms and then thinking how we're actually going to measure those harms in, in seeing whether they're economically meaningful. Uh, I'll stop there and allow some of the other participants to jump in. Thank you. I'm going to go to Robin next. Robin, you've written extensively about some of the harms uh, in a digital economy specifically. You spoke to us about some of the intersections between competition law and labor. Uh, maybe you could briefly speak to how uh, monopsony power and the gig economy may, might fit into this broader conversation around digital competition. Over to you. Yeah, and um, uh, I, I have some thoughts on that and I want to also tie it into this conversation that we're having here about identifying anti-competitive behaviors and using um, a more empirical um, effects-based uh, standard for evaluating anti-competitiveness. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. But to start off with the, the labor question, uh, like I mentioned before, competition authorities around the world, they're starting to wake up to the fact that there are competition issues in labor markets and that these issues are a real problem and that competition law needs to start considering these issues. Uh, historically, competition policy and law enforcement have not meaningfully considered labor markets. Um, and enforcement and competition, enforcing competition laws and labor markets, it's becoming all the more important with the rise of digitization and platforms like driver and delivery apps, for example. These business models can exacerbate the negative impacts of low competition and may also introduce new types of competition problems. So to address these issues, the Bureau first needs to start enforcing the laws we already have to address and prevent competition policy, pro competition problems in labor markets. Uh, we already have some powerful tools at our disposal, like merger investigations. And, and I think the Bureau needs to start considering the impact of mergers on workers. The government has also proposed this uh, new provision in the Competition Act that would make wage fixing and agreements between employers not to hire each other's workers a criminal offense. And this is a positive change, but the tool also has limits. And I think to fully address competition issues in labor markets, we may need to consider new sections to the Act that allow the Bureau to assess other types of harmful conduct in labor markets. Now, as part of broader reforms to the act, and this ties into both the labor story, but also markets across the economy, we need to be re-examining the way that the Competition Act tests whether certain behaviors are harmful to competition. And this ties into the conversation we're having here about being able to quantify harms. I think that this debate is actually a bit of a misnomer. Um, I think that this desire to quantify harm is the result of us going down some rabbit hole when it comes to the design of our competition law that actually is not effective. In a study that um, I did along with actually Bess Bednar and um, another colleague of ours, Anna Corey, we did an investigation into several different behaviors that are typical of digital markets to evaluate whether the Competition Act is fit for purpose in addressing potential competition problems in these um, situations. And the result what we kept coming up with again and again is that this effect-based way of evaluating anti-competitiveness, that is this desire to quantify literally every issue that we find under the Competition Act actually makes our law weaker and it prevents us from addressing problems in competition that may have long-term outcomes. So 
I think a standard that is more presumptive in nature, that sets clear rules, that is rules-based rather than effects-based, is going to be more effective in the long run. What that actually looks like in practice is another question, but I think that's something that we need to be thinking about as the review of the Competition Act kicks off, and it has relevance in both labor markets, but I think also, too, around the economy more broadly. Robin, thank you so much. Team, I'm going to keep us in plenary for some rapid fire questions where I can get around to everyone. And I want to flag for uh, people who are listening in. You know, these are these are big conversations and big questions. And we're kind of having two uh, concurrent conversations, not just here, but also in Canada, right? We're having a very mechanical conversation sometimes about specifically how the act can work. Uh, and we're having a philosophical conversation about the role of competition policy and as a suite uh, in our suite of economic tools. Um, we've been talking about getting clear with definitions, quantification, and I want to do a rapid go around. It's, it's widely acknowledged that Canada also suffers from a lack of competition research, right? And I wondered in the future, what are some key metrics that we should be looking at as a way to understand whether this pending and, and future reforms to the Competition Act have been meaningful? What comes to mind for you? Um, Tahira, if that's okay, I'll go to you first, and then we'll go to Matthew, Brandon, and Robin. You ready? Yes. All right. What should a, what would a metric be that we could think about going forward? Commissioner Boswell, why don't I go to you while we uh, bring Tahira back because I saw her box go blank. I mean, is it is it is it productivity, right? Like what do what are the key metrics? What are the benchmarks that people uh, tend to look at to evaluate how uh, where are measures of our competition? Yeah, sorry. To you. It's OK. So, I mean, Vass, if we tie it to reforms of the Competition Act uh, alone, that that becomes tricky to uh, come up with with metrics because you know we're f we're um, obviously going to vigorously enforce the laws as i said um, we've been doing that uh, of late and and we'll continue doing that measuring the impact of any legislative change can be difficult because uh, it goes beyond you know measuring the bureau's enforcement activity or um, I don't want to say, I hate saying win-loss record, but that sort of thing. Um, having clear, well-thought-out laws that are fit for purpose in the digital economy should, I guess, promote compliance. Um, mm -hmm. We would then, you know, compliance is ultimately what we want to achieve uh, and can be very difficult to measure. I can say, though, more generally, I mean, I, I think it's been clear from my comments earlier that, that Reforming the law is very important, don't get me wrong, but it's a piece of a bigger puzzle in this country. Um, and, you know, com we, we need to see competitive intensity rise in our country. Um, we need to see if there's more focus on the role of competition in the conduct of our economic affairs as a country. Um, mm -hmm. If we, I, you know, if I, I would say if we see a metric where more people are engaged, more uh, citizens are engaged in demanding competition uh, in markets coast to coast to coast. That would be um, that would be an important metric. But then you have to look at. Sorry, I'm going on a bit long. I know we're in a rapid fire, but I mean this is rapid fire. Countries. Yeah, I feel. Yeah, go ahead. Look at what other countries have done. Look what Australia did with its Productivity Commission, and you have measurable results yep. there, where they, you know, they raised average household income by seven thousand dollars a year, Australian dollars, and and credited a GDP rise of two point five percent because they said we need to focus on competition as a country, mm -hmm. and look at the benefits I it pays off. We can have that. And one last thing, I'm sorry. Um, we are working on right now uh, at the Bureau uh, uh, an examination of the current state of competition in Canada through measuring competitive intensity wow. across different sectors of the economy. We're working with Statistics Canada to obtain and analyze data, and we intend to uh, produce something as a result of that in the coming months that will give us a snapshot. And maybe that's the snapshot that we could use as the baseline relative to reforms and a culture of competition in this country. 
I think that's very helpful. Thank you. And welcome back to Kira. You know, uh, I think the metrics goes to helping people understand the value of that culture of competition and also that we're making progress. Uh, Tahira, a few quick words on metrics. What pops to mind for you? Yeah, I know. I don't know. I missed the discussion. So someone might have already mentioned this. I was talking about like the mergers which have already happened. So maybe there is a need to go back and review those mergers because I know the Competition Bureau in their submission had mentioned that the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission in the US, is studying mergers going back as much as like 35 years. So I think that's what Canada needs to do. In order to do that, though, of course, the Competition Bureau needs to have the requisite authority and the funds to be able to do that. But that's really important in order to inform the future merger evaluations and reviews. Yeah. Sorry for that. I, I lost you guys in between. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No need to apologize. We're glad you're back. So, you know, numbers of mergers, numbers of mergers reviewed as a, as a proxy for consolidation, perhaps. Robin, a couple of key metrics on your mind. Yeah, um, I'll be very quick. Um, one theme I want to bring up here is the idea of evaluation. So the federal government actually has a formalized process for evaluating programs, the policy on results. And under the policy of results, the Competition Bureau's activities have only been evaluated twice in the last 17 years. And these evaluations only look at a sliver of some of the Bureau's activities. So I think that as part of this review, we need to be thinking about a broader evaluation framework for all of the Bureau's activities so that we can Thank have you. ongoing insight and data. Thank you. And Brandon, uh, anything that you'd like to add? The number of private actions on competition policy. You know, that's something we can measure. It's something we can change in the law. It's something that will help the Bureau in its activities. Absolutely. That's a great one. Lots of food for thought. Thanks, team. So we have so many questions coming in from the audience, and thank you, and apologies to our audience members, as I haven't gone to any of them. Um, lots are, uh, uh, some are very specific about particular amendments, um, but why don't I put one forward to the Commissioner, something we haven't spoken about, though we were sort of saying, uh, hearing from you, Commissioner Boswell, in your opening remark, you know, we all have a role to play uh, in building and participating in that culture of competition. Um, what are the measures that are in place to protect whistleblowers that might speak up about a competition issue or law um, and could be subject to prejudice and other forms of retribution? I think that's worth bringing up simply because perhaps of the, you know, notification uh, elements that the that the Bureau has. Is that an OK question? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's there are there's a section in the Competition Act that uh, specifically sets out protection for whistleblowers. We also have um, in in the context of cartel activity and um, false and misleading practices, we have the ability for people to uh, individuals to come in and blow the whistle on uh, criminal conduct that they're aware of going on and they will then mm -hmm. get immunity um, from prosecution. So these are issues that we uh, we deal with on a regular basis. Um, we understand that, you know, people sometimes are, are taking a step uh, outside of their comfort zone when they want to report something. And as I say, mm -hmm. there's a whistleblower provision in the law and, and we're used to uh, dealing with these and, and understand the concerns. I actually um, have spoken in the past about uh, the Bureau, um, if we had the ability, we don't have the ability right now, but to implement something like the Ontario Securities Commission has where we actually can pay people uh, who provide significant, oh. meaningful information to detect wrongdoing in the economy. But that's another day. That's that's a debate for another day. <laughs> hey, we'll Google that. A bounty system. Mohan, <laughs> thank you for that question. And, you know, for our listeners, if you if you have a competition question or something you'd like to dialogue, I feel like I wish I had a number at the bottom of our screen, but do feel free to get in touch <laughs> with the Bureau. Um, I have another question coming in. Uh, this is from a, a fellow, uh, a CG fellow, Jennifer. Um, what is the role? It's a big one, so we'll, we'll try to be quick, but we'll wrap up on it. Um, what's the role? There's a couple of questions in here, actually. What's the role of competition in digital governance overall? Um, who should be at the table to ensure we can respond to the challenges of the transformation of the economy and society in a way that ensures we reap the benefits of the new economy, but also guards against its potential harms? 
probably a very big goal, a juicy topic. And then finally, and here's a really interesting kind of federalist aspect, um, uh, do the provinces have a role here? Who might like to jump in first? Give me a quick signal, oh. we'll do a go around. Well, you know, Commissioner Boswell, it's kind of in your remarks a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, working with others in government, it, do you see a, a stronger role for the provinces moving forward here? Well, there are certain aspects where, of course, you know, the provinces could could take steps uh, on their own to deal with um, certain issues. I mean, the provinces per se have consumer protection. Um, the mm -hmm. bureau's work, uh, the bureau's work touches the area of consumer protection, and it's sometimes described as consumer protection in terms of certain business practices that are false or misleading. Um, but there are there are many things that provinces could do to buttress their consumer protection laws uh, that would help uh, in areas that that we touch on as well at the Competition Bureau. Um, you know, we do uh, work regularly with other uh, enforcement or other federal agencies like the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to the extent we can. There are rules that okay. limit it um and and others around uh, the federal table but in in the digital governance you know there could easily be um something where all the players are brought together because there's an increasing overlap in areas particularly um with digital platforms and the issues that they present for canadians for businesses so we do work with others as much as we can but certainly an idea could be to bring people together in some form of um established body well if we've got any provinces listening into our talk I th i'm sure their their ears are perking up i'm being a little bit silly let's wrap up where we're getting short on time i'll do a bit of a go around uh for people who are new to the broader competition conversation learning briefing up looking ahead to participate in building that culture of competition and this future uh pending consultation we've heard about what's one thing you'd encourage them to keep in mind or think about or that you'd like to make sure people know about how competition works in canada a little bit broad but um Brandon, I'll start with you. I'll go to Robin, Tahira, and uh, Commissioner Boswell. I'll let you close out. So this is a really hard question to close on, but Sorry. maybe I'll sum up with this. Uh, competition law can't solve all problems in Canadian society or the Canadian economy. It is one piece of a larger suite. Keep it in context. I like it. Robin? Yeah, I think, you know, what people need to know is that we need to have a fundamental rethink on what role competition should play in our economy and our lives. And there's no one way to have competition play that role. Um, but we do know that our current approach of uh, oligopolistic way of organizing our economy and society, it's just not cutting it anymore. We need to be rethinking where we're at. We can do better, rethink it. I think that's a great one. Tahira? Yeah, I have something similar to say to Robin is basically going back and looking at the purpose and the role the competition law plays in our society and how it could advance those specific goals. And also, I just wanted to say one more thing, like competition law is not something which is just for academics and policy enthusiasts or economists to discuss and elaborate on. I think it's something that should be in school curriculums. I don't know if it's already there, and but it should be there. Students should be encouraged from the very beginning to learn about these basics and how it affects them and their marketplace and of course their livelihoods and the like quality of life they have in the long term. So that's my take on that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Boswell, something people should hold in their minds? Well, I mean, I agree uh, with the, what Tahira just said about uh, the importance of everyone, um, everyone understanding how it affects their life every single day or how a lack of competition affects their life every, every single day. Healthy competition is a key pillar, if not the key pillar of a free market economy, of a successful, you know, free market economy where everyone shares in the benefits. And I'll end by just quoting what President Biden said last year, capitalism without competition is exploitation. We need a culture of competition in this country. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, competition, it's for 
everyone. Uh, the Competition Act itself can't do everything, but we can also reimagine it uh, and we have an opportunity to do so. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. I will say a few things in closing, which is just that there are two events also related to competition that will follow this. The next one, the second one, is going to be on June 1st at the same bat time, which is 12 p.m. Eastern, and that will focus uh, on putting Canada's Competition Act in an international context. We hope you'll join us again, and our third and final event will happen on June 8th. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Commissioner Boswell. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Goodbye.